I'm very pleased to welcome back to our program Congressman Bill Foster. He represents Illinois' 11th District. You remember him as the scientist who we sent to Congress. Bill, how are you? Well, I'm scrambling, you know, which happens uh, this time of the election season. But, um, uh, geez, I was, you know, the, the Illinois 11th District is spread out over eight different counties. Uh, every one of the collar counties, um, plus Belvedere, Boone County out uh, near Belvedere. And just for fun, we have a few precincts down in Lamont and Cook County. So I am horizontally diversified, which means an election <laughs> time. I spend a lot of time in a car. I was just up with Jan Tchaikovsky um, in Crystal Lake that we share. Uh, and so it was uh, just a really good time. We were celebrating uh, some money that Jen and I got to restore a creek, a Crystal Lake Creek, back to its natural state. Because they, back in the 1950s, had stuffed it into a culvert, which turns out huh. to be an environmental environmental and a flooding mistake uh, that they are, that we got money to reverse. And, Bringing home the bacon, uh, that's what we that's what we like to hear. When you, Bill, when, as you've been traveling around to all these different places, what are people saying to you or what are they asking you? What do you feel are their top concerns? Well, everyone is uh, nervous about the election, um, no matter which side they're on. They're Bill, nervous. I've had a stomach ache for about three months now. I'm right there with them. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Well, I think it's it's important, especially when you're under stress, to calm down and stay focused. And, you know, my job is uh, to just do the best we can everywhere we can and to try to be, you know, I have to, I have to maintain my own survival politically and then uh, do everything I can to help the nearby Democrats in winnable races. Like, yeah, and you have to do it every two years as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, interesting, true story. Um, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who had served both in the House and the Senate, right after he became president, sent a high-priority communication to Congress that said, you guys in the House, you have to have four-year terms. And he sent a very thoughtful four-page summary of why it's time for a constitutional amendment for four-year terms. And um, so Well, honestly, thinking, I've thought about this, and it does seem ridiculous that you have to run for re-election every two years. It, that seems counterproductive to me of getting actually getting things done because you can't you can't ever relax and just look at the issues. You always have to have an eye toward the next election. And I agree with LBJ. Yep. Well, you know, I was actually thinking of responding to that White House communication and <laughs> saying, you know, it's been a while, but uh, but you're right. And here's the proposal. <laughs> See if I can yeah. get some Republicans on board because it's a, you know it, it means that there's there's you know somewhere between six and twelve months where Congress is sort of frozen, yes, and incapable of doing anything. And mm -hmm. if you could you could get a factor of two reduction in that by making it happen half as often. So um, well, um, Bill, a, I know that you're a, a nuclear scientist and not an economist, but I would like to talk to you. You know, um, about the people who say, well, you know, I'm, uh, if I'm going to vote for Trump, it'll be because of the economy. Talk to me about what you see as Trump's economic plan. Well, it's mainly more tax cuts for the rich. If you look at the, his signature achievement when he was president, it was a massive tax cut skewed to the wealthy. And that is the number one um, thing that we're going to have to deal with, because those tax cuts are going to expire next year. And and so we have to understand what will replace them. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look, um, there have been... Uh, there have been academic studies of what the effect of the Trump's tax cuts were. And they, you look the two years before they came into effect and the two years after, before COVID hit. And there was a very small effect on the productive economy. If you look at the rate of job growth, it was essentially unchanged. You know, Trump inherited a very strong record of job growth under Obama, and it simply continued. And it did not accelerate when um, the Trump tax cuts were passed. What did accelerate was an explosion of the federal deficit, mm, exactly, and the wealth piling up at the top, which was yeah. his intention. Yeah, um, and so and this is, yeah. Then this is going to be important. 
Do you think it's confusing for people because he keeps insisting that uh, tariffs are not taxes, that somehow tariffs are going to be paid for by the foreign countries trying to sell their goods here? And everybody of any kind of res- re- who has any kind of understanding of these issues, Forbes, Bloomberg, um, they're all saying, no, that's not how tariffs work. You know, it's going to be a tax and it's going to raise the price on all the stuff you buy at the store. But um, I don't know. It drives me crazy. We've learned this, We've learned this lesson before. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the smooth all the tariff acts in night of 1930. Now, they were passed at the start of the Great Depression. And economic historians say it's one of the worst blunders in the entire 20th century. You know, it, it's interesting to look at the history there. It, it was the two lead um, members of Congress were Senator Reed Smoot, a Republican, and Representative Willis Hawley, also a Republican, and signed into law by Herbert Hoover, a Republican. And what it did, it just indiscriminately raised U.S. tariffs on over 20,000 imported goods. All right. And it, what it did is what everyone warned them. It ignited an international trade war that um, just completely gutted uh, the fortunes of rural and urban America. And, it, and everyone has looked at it and said it really lengthened and, and de- added depth to the Great Depression. And this is and we actually suffered a lot under Trump's tariff policies, uh, you know, back uh, in his first term. Um, you know, there was a manufacturer in my district who was just horrified. He called me and you've got to do something about this when he saw that Trump, Trump's tariffs were being applied to the imported steel that he used in mm-hmm. his products. But they were not applied to the steel content of finished Chinese manufactured goods. So this was the, which is like a recipe for pushing manufacturing offshore or specifically into China, if that's a way to evade the steel tariffs. And that was, you know, the sort of stupidity that we were seeing in Trump's tariffs. And he got in a big trade fight with Mexico. Right. You know, he would. Well, first off, he insult them. You know, as a businessman, sort of the first thing, the first lesson is don't insult your customer. And so he he threatened and insulted Mexico. And what did they do? They started importing corn from Brazil. You know, and, and which is a real threat long term because in Brazil you get two corn crops a year because it's near the equator. All right, and, and that hurts and so, Illinois. Yeah, and this were, this resulted in historically low grain prices, and Trump had to to pay for this to keep um, uh, you know rural America from turning against him. He had to fork over twenty billion dollars of taxpayer subsidies, all right, just to keep rural America afloat. We were spending more on farmer subsidies to make them whole because of his tariffs than we were spending on like nuclear weapons or anything else. And it was, you know, this is not a recipe for making America great again. Um, and, and look, at trade issues aren't simple. You know, I mean, we have a strategic interest in keeping the Chinese surveillance software out of our cars, which is really frightening. If you look at what all the information Chinese cars send back to China, or our baby crib monitors, you know, they found spyware in baby crib monitors. Oh, my God. Yeah, it is really bad. The U.S., and we have a strategic interest in keeping our supply chains for things like computer chips and other things, um, in, in, at least in the hands of friendly nations. They don't have to be all in America, but they've got to be in the hands of, of countries we trust. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about what you said about the spyware and cars, because I know with modern cars and all the electronics and connected to the satellites and the Wi-Fi, I know that a lot of information like where you drive and how fast you drive, um, a lot of that information is recorded and uploaded to car companies. But that's not what you're talking about here? Well, that, that is. And then the problem is when it's Chinese cars, they're sending that information back to China. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, um, no, and I understand why, you know, for example, a self-driving car has to keep a record of everything it's seen and done. So if it gets into an accident, you can say, okay, let's look at the last 60 seconds of data and find out if the car made a mistake or it was some other factor. Um, and, and so that's entirely reasonable to record that information in a car. Um, then there's another discussion of if the car is going to educate the, the artificial intelligence software driving the car, if it's going to educate itself on real world experience, it has to send some data back. But we need to be sure that that data isn't, um, you know, isn't being sent back to China or, or wherever else, whoever wow. else might be interested. So that, that's something. And, and these, just because you turn
turn the ignition key off does not mean that the car stops recording data. And that's and so we need we need clear understandings and rules on that too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have a Tesla. Uh, and, you know, my partner wants to buy one of those bumper stickers that says, we bought this car before we knew Elon Musk was crazy. Uh, but that's beside the point. But I have a Tesla app on my phone. And if the car is just parked in the garage, I can still pull it up. It'll tell me where the car is parked, how much of a charge there is, um, all kinds of information that the car is still clearly broadcasting. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I understand the kinds of stuff you're we talking about. Yeah. yeah, and I, I've, had, I've had this fantasy for a long time of having a big bright red button on the middle of my dashboard. So when someone like runs a stoplight right in front of you, you just sort of punch that button and it sends thirty seconds of video to the police to get them a ticket. Or <laughs> I, oh, here's my pet peeve: when you're on the Kennedy or the uh, the Edens. And you get one of those crazy drivers who's decided to shave five minutes off of their commute. So they change lanes like some kind of NASCAR driver back and forth. And other people have to then hit the brakes. And those are the people I want to get caught because it never seems like there's a cop car around when somebody has turned the Kennedy into some sort of NASCAR course. But that's just my own personal. And well, that's, I think, gotten worse since COVID. And I don't understand. Something broke during COVID. Um, you know, I think maybe it was during the time, the early the period, period in COVID, when the roads were just empty, when everyone was locked down, and that you discovered that you're driving on an empty interstate and you can, in fact, go 90 miles an hour pretty safely. And then everyone said, oh, well, I'll just keep doing that. Jeez, please. <laughs> And that was it. And the police, of course, wouldn't, during the early part of COVID, they weren't going to stop you because we didn't know who was spreading COVID. And so that I think that's when it broke. But we just have to, uh, you know, start driving like our parents taught us instead of yeah. what's happening during COVID. That's a, another one of my pet peeves. <laughs> I, I'm really, and just to be clear, I'm not advocating to turn every one of us into little spies on each other. Mm-hmm. But we have to just do better, do better at um, driving politely. I want to continue my conversation with Congressman Bill Foster. He had a an event with Tammy Duckworth uh, last week that I want to talk to him about. We need to take a real quick break. Um, I want you to know that WCPT's election coverage is sponsored by the Chicago Federation of Labor. Standing up for working people in Cook County. We'll be back after this. Joan Esposito, live, local, and progressive on WCPT 820. I'm joined by 11th District Congressman Bill Foster. We've been talking about some of the issues that uh, he's been discussing with his constituents. But there was an event last week that he did with uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth on in vitro fertilization. Bill, talk to us about that event and uh, what was discussed. Well, it was... uh you know, well, Tammy has a very personal story that she had a lot of courage uh, to to talk about publicly. Uh, you know, it used to be that uh, that there was sort of a stigma attached to IVF, and that there were so many, or or a stigma attached to infertility. You know, there was a feeling that oh, is there something just wrong with you as a human being if you had difficulty uh, conceiving and raising children? And and now, you know, the advances in science are incredible. You know, we understand. Uh, you know, there was a story in today's paper about when a sperm is entering an egg, there are three specific, a combination of three specific proteins that enable the sperm to penetrate the wall of the egg to go in. And without these three, um, they can't make it in. And with these three, they, they sail right through. And this was just discovered and published. And it's, uh, and it, it's present in animals from, you know, multicellular, small multicellular animals to primates. Uh, and humans, <laughs> and and so this is an example of the incredible amount of understanding we have. And with that understanding, we can make it possible for couples who were incapable of having a child uh, to um, to have it, to have the family they want at the time they want it. And this, uh, you know, the idea that you know Republicans are uh, passing these so-called you know personhood amendments or things that define. Um, full human rights, uh, uh, something that starts at the moment of conception, is pretty much a prohibition on IVF. Mm-hmm. And, and oh, 
Oh, you mean you don't believe Donald Trump would make it free because you know he's the father of IVF? Well, he, yeah, he will say anything. You know, I know. Marcy Kemp. Marcy Kaptur said something very perceptive about J.D. Vance and Donald Trump, which is that they were both treated poorly as children. That J.D. Vance wrote a whole book about his his difficult childhood. You know, Donald Trump. You know, his father was, uh, by all accounts, not a very nice person. And no, and apparently his mother not, wasn't either. And and you know, and Donald uh, was not the favorite son. And so for a bunch of reasons, he didn't have a great childhood. And I think that both J.D. Vance and Donald Trump have been spending their adult lives trying to make up for that. And then they can't. It's just damage that was done to them as children. And that is why they will lie and do anything, change their positions at the drop of a hat to please whatever group they're with. And I think that was a very perceptive statement about what's Mm -hmm. going on inside our minds of why, you know, J.D. Vance has just made a 180-degree turn. Oh, God, yes. Donald Trump. And he's not, neither one of them are dumb people. They are, but they're just so desperate for the affection they didn't have as a child. And Bill, I know you you have to deal with a lot of different personality types in Congress, but what, what I find more difficult to tolerate. Yes, I agree with you. I think Donald Trump is a broken human being, but Donald Trump would never have been able to do what he did. He would not be able to continue doing what he's doing if he didn't have enablers in people who know better. They know better and either to protect their own re-election or to protect their own political future, they are willing to try to gaslight us and tell us that his lies aren't lies, they're actually true. Those are the people that I find particularly reprehensible, not the people who are broken and don't know any better. Yeah, you know, um, um, if you talk to Adam Kinzinger about who you know lived through this as a member of the Republican caucus, uh, and he said the, the point that things broke were when after January 6th, and, you know, all the leaders of the Republican Party said, okay, we've had it with Donald Trump. And then Kevin McCarthy went down to Mar-a-Lago and kissed the ring mm-hmm. and said, okay, we forgive you. Let's, you're the leader of our party, blah, 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 and and made it okay to uh, be on Team Trump again. And, um, and so, you know, the same thing, uh, you know, the Senate leader uh, said a very, very, um, frankly, a moving and correct statement about the, the guilt of Donald Trump uh, for January 6th. And um, and then he's now completely back on Team Trump. Yeah, and there was um there was a documentary yeah, from part of the Chicago International Film Festival called The Last Republican. And they had cameras following um Adam Kinzinger for his last, I don't know if it was his full year, his full last year in Congress. And he talks a lot about Kevin McCarthy and said that it, Kevin McCarthy's reversal really shocked him because he, he said Kevin McCarthy always seemed to him to be bright. He seemed to, he seemed to be a really good politician. I mean, when Adam Kinzinger announced his engagement, Kevin McCarthy sent him a text saying offering to officiate at his wedding. He said, Kevin McCarthy wasn't just a a political colleague. He was my friend. And I don't know what happened to him. And I, you know, Kevin McCarthy, Lindsey Graham. I mean, how many people can we count who used to say one thing and then ended up kissing the ring for Donald Trump? Yeah, I I think that what goes on in their mind is they, they... They start conflating their own political success with uh, the all of the issues they care about. You know, like they they enter government, say they really care about small government and so on, and that's or or you know preventing abortion or whatever it is they really care about. And then they have, over time say, and it's so important that I succeed to succeed at those things that it is their personal success that becomes more important than the issues they really care about. And that's what enables them to, you know, say, I'm a very religious person, but I will follow Donald Trump, uh, despite all of his questionable, uh, you know, background and, and what he did in office. Um, and, and yet, because you care about one or two things, including your own political survival, um, yeah. that, then you end up just getting confused about the difference between, um, you know, the issue 
issues that you ran on in the first place and your own personal uh, success. And that's that's where you go off the tracks on this. I feel pretty confident that we will have a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives after this next election. Do you feel that way, too? Oh, I'd give it about a <laughs> 70, 70% chance. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing is that the House, if, if we don't have a good election, if we lose the presidency, if we lose the Senate, which is probably more likely than not, um, that that the House is going to be the only firewall that's left mm-hmm. you know, for our democracy. And it's, and it's not going to be easy because even if we have control, it will be with a very small governing majority. And, you know, we spent two years snickering at the Republicans and having a hard time. You know, we are going to be able to elect a speaker and so on. You know, Hakeem Jeffries is a really good, um, really good leader and, uh, and just very smart and very effective. Uh, and so I, I'm not worried that we're going to have the same chaos of not electing a speaker. But if our margin is very small, that every special election and that happens and everything will become a big deal. Yeah. Every member who decides to retire early and and take a vote away from us uh, will be important. So yeah. it will be, we'll be walking a tightrope even if we get a bare majority. Well, so. thank you for spending time with us. I know how crazy busy you are right now. And I really appreciate the conversation and your insights, Bill. Well, thank you so much. You're a very valuable voice in in the wilderness out here. (laughs) And I will continue to shout into the wilderness as long as I have people like you who will shout with me, okay? All right. Bargain. (laughs) Congressman Bill Foster represents Illinois' 11th District.